Hi everyone, welcome back to our Bofas' channel. Today we have the Sapphire RX 1600 XT as our XGPU unit and we will show how it performs with the MacBook Pro 15-inch 2012. For those who might be new here and have no idea what's going on, we recommend you to watch our last video demonstrating how all of these hardwares are connected together. Hopefully it will help you to get a better understanding of what we're talking about in this video. So this is today's setup. On the right hand is the test setup we're going to present today, while on the other side is an iMac 27-inch 2011 that has been modified to connect Radeon RX 5700 XT externally. We're gonna give it a quick look on the graphics display tab. We have dual GPU connected here, a GTX 765M connected via PCIe X8 inside this Mac with a form of MXM B3.0, and another GPU RX 5700 XT connected through the DVD drive slot. Click the MVM Express tab and you'll see one Samsung 970 EVO connected via PCIe X4. We will show the internet setup for this iMac at the end of this video, so make sure to watch this video to the end. There's nothing fancy for today's setup. We have two monitors connected directly to the rear ports of the RX 1600 XT. Next, we're gonna plug in the XGPU PCIe cable, MagSafe, USB speaker, GPU power cord, and fire it up. We're gonna boot into macOS Big Sur 11.4 Beta 1, the macOS version that officially has support for the Radeon 6000 series GPU. If you wanna use the RX 400 or 500 series based on Polaris architecture, you will need macOS Mojave 10.14 or later to make these GPUs work correctly. If you wanna use the RX 5000 series based on Navi 10, you will need to use at least macOS Catalina 10.15.1. The same story applies here if you wanna use the RX 6000 series based on Navi 21, the one we're going to test today, so you'll need to install macOS Big Sur 11.4 or later. Now back to the scene, as the macOS finally boots to the login screen, only then the external monitors will show up. It looks so simple right? So as usual, about this Mac shows us a MacBook Pro 15-inch 2012 running on macOS Big Sur 11.4 Beta and we can still see the Intel HD 4000 as its graphics option. Now we will make the largest monitor here as the main display, so we're gonna open the system preferences, displays, select the arrangement tab, Grab the white bar on the screen, and if you hover it onto another screen selection, you will see red rectangle starts to appear at the edge of the screen that you're gonna choose. So drag it to our left screen here to replace it. Bam! Now we're gonna go to About This Mac again, and you can see that it's already selected the RX 1600 XT with 16 gigs of VRAM as its graphics option. This is because our main display on this external monitor is driven by the XGPU, while the built-in display is still driven by the integrated GPU of this MacBook Intel HD 4000. We're not going to do anything that is super heavy today, so we'll start off by doing simple benchmarks like Geekbench 5. So you can see our MacBook specs here, then we will choose the Compute tab, make sure the RX 1600 XT is selected and start to run the test for OpenCL. Now we can see the GPU's fan start spinning and it takes about 31 seconds to complete. The scores for OpenCL that we get this time is around 118,000 points. Now switch to middle tab and run the test again. This time it completes the test in 35 seconds and we get around 160,000 points. If we're looking at these trials, actually these scores are a bit lower than the average scores posted by other users. This might happen because of several reasons. The first reason is because we're using Intel mobile CPU instead of desktop CPUs like they're using. The second reason is because PCIe lanes that we're able to extract from this MacBook logic board is only 8 PCIe lanes instead of 16 lanes that most desktop PCs have. To make it worse, the RX 1600 XT is actually a GPU that supports PCIe 4.0 but this 2012 MacBook Pro only has PCIe 3.0. Before we even started this XGPU project, we knew that this system would have a huge bottleneck, but we did it nonetheless because you can't really find new chips for the NVIDIA GT650M to repair dead GPU issues. And if you use the RX 1600 XT inside the eGPU Thunderbolt 2 interface, it will result in a much severe bottleneck that start with 10 gigabit per second Thunderbolt 1 bandwidth and only 4 lanes PCIe 2.0. So actually, this XGPU modification is not that bad. Who doesn't want a much powerful GPU on their Mac, right? The result here is almost 2 times much faster than the RX 5700 XT and is still much higher than the Radeon Pro 7 as well as the Radeon Pro Vega 2 Duo that shipped with Mac Pro 2019. Even the M1 SoC only gets around 20,000 metal scores on Geekbench 5. We'll attach the links to these scores in the description below. 
For the next test, we will try to play 8K and 4K HEVC footage from Sony Alpha 1 and A7S Mark III. HEVC stands for High Efficiency Video Coding. Some of you might already know that the HEVC codec is only supported on Macs made in 2016 that uses Intel Skylake and later. But somehow we're able to activate HEVC acceleration on this 2012 MacBook Pro using Open Core that we will talk about in another video. One of the ways to check HEVC acceleration is to use the Video Proc software. So install and open the apps. Select video, go to hardware acceleration engine option on the right side, click the refresh icon. Finally, you can see that this MacBook supports 4K H.264 and 4K HEVC acceleration. So the 8K and 4K footage here are downloaded from the CameraLabs.com by Gordon Lang and thank you for allowing us to test this footage. You can check his website in the links below. We also have an M1 Mac Mini with 8GB of RAM and 500GB of SSD to compare with our results today. The first one that we're gonna test is a 4K sample from Sony A7S Mark III with 10-bit 422 HEVC codec at 100 megabit per second. Sony A7S Mark III, 4K, 24P, XAVC HS, 10-bit, 422. This is at 35mm f11. Sony A7S Mark III, 4K, 24P, XAVC HS, 10-bit, 422. This is at 35mm f11. The next one is 8K samples from Sony Alpha 1 with a 10-bit 420 HEVC codec at 200 megabit per second and another one with 400 megabit per second. So all of them can play the footage really well except the unmodified 2012 MacBook Pro. Next, we will perform the Bruce X 5K test on the Final Cut Pro 10.5.2. Before we start anything, we need to make sure the RX 6900 XT is selected on the playback settings. We have imported the Bruce X.xml file and will export it to the highest quality available that is Apple ProRes 4444XQ. We're gonna save it to our Samsung 970 EVO and we will stop the stopwatch when it finishes rendering. So the 2012 MacBook Pro takes 13 seconds to export ProRes 4444XQ and the same export settings require 30 seconds to complete on our M1 Mac Mini. Exporting the same project to ProRes 422LT takes around 11 seconds for the 2012 MacBook Pro while the M1 Mac Mini still takes 30 seconds to finish. Next, we have this raw red code from Red Helium 8K S35 footage downloaded from the Red website. Applying stabilization to this 9 second clip takes 31 seconds to complete on this MacBook Pro. On the M1 Mac Mini, it takes 1 minute and 47 seconds to finish the task. Exporting the same red code raw clip to ProRes 422 HQ takes 40 seconds on the 2012 MacBook Pro, and the M1 Mac Mini finishes in about 1 minute. Out of all these tests, it's really great to know that this 9 years old machine can still perform better than the M1. Next, we will run the Blackmagic RAW speed test for the next benchmark. You can download the installer from their official website. Launch the app, press the start button and wait until it determines which B-RAW compression that this Mac can actually handle. 
So after the last column finishes the chart, you can stop the test by pressing the button again. So we can see here that it supports up to several 8K resolution for Metal API by the RX 6900 XT GPU. From the results here, we can estimate that it can handle a maximum of 8K 30 frames per second if we work with B-RAW 12 to 1, 8 to 1 and 5 to 1 footage. For the B-RAW 3 to 1, you can see that it starts to struggle as it takes only at the 8K 25 frames per second but not the 8K 30 frames per second. Next, we will launch DaVinci Resolve Studio 17. In the software preferences, the RX 6900 XT GPU is automatically selected as the main display GPU. For now, we're still testing the DaVinci Resolve with this setup, so we're not going to present it now, but we do have all those sample 12K resolution Blackmagic RAW from Ursa Mini Pro 12K camera downloaded from their website. Hopefully, we will have time to make a full review about it. The last one that we're gonna do is we will boot in Windows 10 and run Geekbench 5 again because we want to compare OpenCL score in Windows 10 versus macOS. We have pre-installed the AMD graphics driver to the SSD and after installing the latest driver, only then the external graphics output on these monitors will show up. So launch the Geekbench 5, run the compute benchmark. So the score for OpenCL in Windows 10 is around 116,000 points compared to 118,000 points that we get in macOS. We will also run the Vulkan Compute Test to compare it with other scores online. So the Vulkan Compute Test gets a score of around 128,000 points which is lower than the average scores posted by other users which is again, might be caused by the bottleneck. So here's our final thoughts on this machine. Despite some bottlenecks in some apps, this machine is still good for video editing. That's it. Anything that is GPU intensive will perform really well, but not for CPU intensive projects. Let's say, if you're compiling code in Xcode or any coding apps, it will not have any significant effect before and after doing this GPU upgrade. For GPU intensive apps like the Final Cut Pro and DaVinci Resolve, we can say the experience is drastically improved. Then, how can this compare with the M1 Max? We personally use both of them and test them with all of this heavy footage. Considering its price and size, it really is a great tiny beast, but for the time being, we will stay with this modded 9 years old machine. Why? Because we are a repair shop that performs 95% of logic board repair as our core business, so it all comes down to maintenance costs and accessible parts. We can say that 2012 MacBook Pro has a rating of 100% repairability rate, its battery pack is removable and cheap, it has non-retina LCD that lasts long and affordable, most importantly, it's not super expensive like the retina LCDs that can cost you another MacBook. And if we ever need sharp monitors, we can hook 4 of them on our XGPU. It also has a screwed keyboard instead of reverted keyboard, cheap trackpad, the board view and schematics are available and almost all ICs can be sourced and replaced if something is dead. We will also can choose what GPUs that we want to use and we will never worry about dead GPU issues again. If this Samsung 970 Evo reaches TBW limit when we use it as Final Cut Pro scratch disk, we can easily replace it with another NVMe disk. To put it in simpler words, this is one of the best machines that you really own. Before the right to repair movement was seriously stressed by Louis Rossman because newer machines are equipped with anti-repair mechanisms. We're kinda impressed with the M1 and it is undoubtedly a really great machine, but you know the facts that using FCP on the M1 will eat up all those SSDs TBW. And actually, it doesn't matter what all those tech YouTubers claim that it has a false alarm reading on TBW and they said you shouldn't be worried about it. Because for us, you can't defy the facts that those NAND SSDs are soldered and in some cases the NANDs were blown up even before the TBW was reached. This issue had been discussed extensively in the repair community, but none of them are legitimately able to replace or upgrade them yet. Not to mention that the M1 Max still don't have any any schematics or board view for us to refer to. So for this reason, we will not completely change our workflow to this tiny beast yet until we find a way to upgrade or replace its soldered NANDs. For now, we will migrate to this modded 2012 MacBook Pro from our dual CPU Mac Pro 5 one that is known to have issues with macOS Big Sur 11.3. But if you have none of these and just want to get started, just get the M1. The GPU's price is ridiculously high for now, so it's kinda not worth to buy it. Since this XGPU project is still in beta stage, it's a good idea for us to start with a machine that has a 100% repairability rate and its parts are cheap. Because when we prove that this hijacking PCIe lanes concept is possible, now we are able to apply the same concept to iMac 2009, 2010, and 2011. And technically, the same concept is applicable to all newer and much more expensive Macs with Intel PCIe lanes. Now we show the internet setup for the iMac Met 2011 that we promised you at the beginning of this video.
So basically this modified iMac now has 3 SATA SSDs, 1 internal NVMe SSD and also 1 external PCIe X8 slot that can be utilized through the DVD drive slot. However, this project is still in its early stage and we need to create a much better PCB to reduce EMI. We're also working on a guide video on how to solder and perform XGPU modification on the A2586 MacBook Pro. If you love this kind of Max modification videos, hit the thumbs up and share it to your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to not miss our next update at iBoffa channel, reverse engineering at its best. Thanks for watching.